Hi everyone and thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alice and I work in the communications team at Moors for the Future Partnership and today I'm joined with by Chris Pembroke who's part of the conservation team. Um, so these webcasts are taking place instead of the bogtastic events that would normally be taking place, uh, that would normally be attending with the bogtastic ban at this time of year um, and as part of the More Life 2020 project uh, which is funded by the EU Life Programme. Seven Trent, Yorkshire Water and United Utilities. So like many of us, Chris has been missing his site visits onto the moors over the lockdown, uh, particularly at this time of the of year, as the moorlands appear to have turned into a carpet of cotton grass. Um, we hope that you enjoyed joining Chris today as he shares some memories of the beautiful plant life um, on the moors across the spectrum of different seasons. Uh, so today we'll be aiming for about 20 minutes of uh, chatting with 10 minutes of questions at the end. So if you do have any questions at any point, just pop them in the right hand side in that panel that should be appearing on your screen uh, and we'll be reaching those at the end for the 10 minute question session. Um, also, though, if you have any comments at all, pop them in there and we'll also have some polls and handouts appearing again in that same panel. Uh, if you have any technical issues at all, so if you lose video or audio at any point, we have found that if you refresh your screen, that should fix the the problem but if you are still having issues please let us know and we'll see what we can do so hi chris hi, Alice. Uh, thanks for coming to talk to us about moorland plants today uh, usually you'd be out on the moors uh, quite often but for the last few weeks uh, it's been quite different for the conservation team i imagine um so chris is going to talk us through um a little journey of um his journey through learning about plant ID. So first off, I think we're going to be taking a look at what we can expect to see at the tail end of spring, which I believe features both hair cell cotton grass and common cotton grass. Um, we do have a little poll to check if you already know these differences between the two. Um, just before Chris, uh, Chris explains the differences. So um, over to you, Chris, to, uh, to chat about in a little bit more detail. Hi, thanks, Alice. Yeah, um, cotton grass is looking like pretty amazing this time of year, and sort of earlier in the early in the sort of late spring as well. Um, and yeah, there's sort of two types of cotton grass, as Alice said. We've got the um, hair tail cotton grass, which you can see on the sort of left-hand photo here, um, and the common cotton grass is on the on the right. And and the difference between them um, in terms of identifying them is um, the hair tail cotton grass tends to ha uh, just has one sort of flower head, the white sort of. Um, uh, sort of ball of looks like cotton wool on the on the end of the stem, um, whereas the common cotton grass tends to have sort of two or three um, um, of these sort of flower heads on the sort of end and side of the of the stem. Um, so that's a kind of a one one way of telling them apart. Um, also, the leaves look quite different. Um, the hair's tail cotton grass tends to have um, yeah sort of narrower narrower thinner leaves and sort of grows in sort of clumps, whereas the uh, common cotton grass um, has sort of wider, broader leaves and sort of grows from like a single point. Um, and um, yeah, it also sort of likes wetter areas, whereas the hair's tail cotton grass tends to grow in sort of slightly, slightly drier areas. So, so yeah, some some clues there for, for spotting the differences and, and trying to choose the Fantastic. the best place for walking across, keeping dry feet. So that's a great tip. <laughs> Um, so let's have a look. Uh, we have oh, a lot of people that weren't so clear on the differences. So hopefully um, that could clarify um, the differences between the two. We do actually have a handout um, which is called More Plants, which will be appearing in the right hand column anytime now. And that does feature the, these, these two species along with many others um, and those two different characteristics. So particularly at the moment, Chris, there seems to be a real carpet of cotton grass across the moors. So is it quite a dominating species? Um, they can sort of, uh, depending on the sort of conditions and the, and the habitats, sort of ha find areas where they do sort of are quite dominant. Um, but um, yeah, in sort of separate areas, and as I said, the common cotton grass quite like sort of wet areas, so especially sort of quite wet sort of um, peat pans and things, you often see those with um, quite a lot of common cotton grass in. Um, but I think with often these things, the closer you look, the more you see. And um, uh, I was on one of my sites with some of the um, uh, casual casual staff who, who are sort of vegetation ID experts um, and doing sort of uh, vegetation ID surveys there. And you initially look and it looks just like kind of all hair's tail cotton grass. And then the closer you look, the more and more you see. And um, yeah, and the list of sort of species that you find is, is 
yeah, it's kind of quite staggering, really. Um, at least it was to me. Um, and yeah, the first place I saw cranberry in the peak. So um, yeah, and initially looking at it, it just looks like it's kind of dominated by this sort of one one species. So yeah, that was really interesting. And uh, yeah, it's been a good learning learning point there. Fantastic. It just takes a closer look. Um, so jumping back a little to the start of spring, uh, what are the other sign first signs of spring returning to the moors what would you be looking for um so i guess sort of those as, as well as the sort of the uh common cotton grass and the hare's tail cotton grass which sort of you see them start coming out um into into flower and especially the hare's tail it's a bit quite early on in the year and um and um, then the sort of little grey sort of um, buds popping up um, with those, but also it's kind of other plants and like uh, the sort of bilberry sort of starting to get leaves back on again and starting to come into flower, um, which um, yeah, you can see here sort of pretty beautiful sort of lantern shaped flowers there. Um, and, and the new growth on the bilberry is always sort of, um, um, yeah, quite nice to see and it's sort of lush green and um, yeah, quite nice to spot. But um, um, and bilberry is one of the plants that we sort of look for um if we are uh, cutting heather on a site for for using the the cut heather the brash um for bare peat restoration elsewhere we kind of do um biosecurity checks to make sure that we're not going to transmit anything from one site to another that we shouldn't be uh, and bilberry is one plant that we look at sort of particularly closely and what would you be looking for in the bilberry so the bilberry can sort of um uh, can have it's quite a rare um but um uh, sort of virus um pa pathogen sort of fungus like pathogen um that can be um on the on the bilberry um so we check it for that sort of visually inspect it and, and test it um if, if needs be but it is it's pretty rare but it needs to be checked before we move the heather from one site to another uh, for using as brass just to make sure we wouldn't be transmitting the, the bilberry um uh, any sort of disease bilberry across with it so oh, wow. Lovely. OK, so as we're teetering on the edge of summer uh, and the days have been getting longer, um, what are the plants that you particularly enjoy seeing in the summer? Um, so I guess sort of summer in the moorlands, people often think of sort of like the purple heathers and stuff. And there's a, see a few different types of types of heather. But um, I think I really quite like um, sort of various bushes which produce berries and fruits um, on the moors. and. Um, Yes, yeah, so it's always quite nice sort of trying to find those and, and spot what you can see and what you can find. So, yeah, it's always it's kind of a personal. Yeah, I'm favorite. always a fan of, uh, of spotting the berries. And I believe we do have a have a poll just to see which of the which which are the, the leading favorites of the of the berries to first um, first be spotted. So feel free to answer that poll. And it's just popped up on your screens now. Um, so, Chris, which is your favorite to be spotting? Um, wow, I do love a good bilberry, um, and you find them quite a few places, and they're quite quite prevalent, which is really nice. Um, but uh, I think yeah, I've got um, the bilberry got a top photo of that in the top left here um, of the fruit when it's sort of in um, when it's sort of riper. Um, but the cloudberry down in the bottom right, and sort of flower and, and fruit on the right, um, is kind of quite always quite special to see. Um, I remember the first time I came across one on Bleaklow, sort of many years before I started with Moors of the Future, but um, sort of saw a plant that looked a bit like a strawberry plant or the leaves did, and, and the fruit looked a bit like some kind of weird, ugly raspberry, and was very confused, had no idea what it was, and um, sort of looked it up when I got home and realised it was, in fact, a cloudberry. So, um, yeah, that was uh, yeah quite nice and will stick with me for a while. But, um, but yeah, and we've got some other, other berries here as well. So top right is... Um, it's a crowberry, crowberry plant with some, some berries on there and they tend to stay on the bush till quite late in the year. If they're not picked or, or eaten, um, uh, grazed or whatever, then they do tend to stay on um, on the plant quite late. They don't tend to fall off so rapidly. So you can sometimes even see those in, in winter um, when they're sort of, you'd have thought they'd be long gone. But um, yeah, and uh, we've got cowberry down on the left. Um, and the plant looks a little bit like bilberry it's kind of a similar sort of leaf bushy plant but um leaves are slightly slightly rounder and slightly darker color um and the berries are sort of a different color as always kind of bright red which is quite quite different um and yeah if you look closely at the leaves they've got sort of small dots on the underside which is a good distinguishing feature um uh to sort of confirm that it is is um yeah it's the cowberry um, and it keeps its leaves over winter, whereas the bilberry tends to lose them. So if you see something 
um, it looks a bit like bilberry um, in the middle of winter. It might be cowberry, so have a little look and have a look at the leaf, the underside of a leaf, and see if you can see those little dots, and that helps sort of confirm confirm that. Fantastic. So let's I'll just have a look and see see what the results are of the poll. So we have bilberry in the lead, um, just ever so slightly though, followed very close behind by the cloudberry. Um, as you said, that that bottom right, it's a really unique. Uh, a unique shape there isn't it that fruit um so what other plants are, are good to see in the summer um so grasses are pretty amazing and and i've got a lot to a lot to learn still um but yeah lots of different types of grasses uh, grasses in, in different places and um yeah and look pretty magical when you get them sort of fully out in the sort of in the flowers we can sort of see them coming out here not quite fully out yet but um um yeah can look pretty beautiful in sort of swathes of the of the grasses in the in the breeze um and yeah i'm still trying to get to grips with uh grass identification um but now is a sort of a good time of year for it so i've uh i've got myself one of the fsc grass id guides Fantastic. um which is uh, pretty handy it covers grasses um that some of the species that you might find up on up on the moors and sort of in the woodlands and in meadows so um yeah various places it's quite good um, and a lot of the idea is based on the sort of the flower heads that are out. So it's quite hard to identify them at different times of year, possible, but not by myself at least. But uh, um, but but also where this photo sort of down the bottom bottom right, um, you can see sort of where the where the leaf comes away from the stem uh, and how it attaches there. The sort of known as ligules uh, sort of vary between different species. So that's another sort of ID feature there to to look for. So get up close and, and have a look and, and with a guide you can hopefully start identifying various things so lovely and i think we have a, a couple of the grasses here do we yep yeah so here we've got um um this is wavy hair grass um it's one of the species that are used in the um in the nurse crops sort of uh, grass seed that we apply as part of the the first step of the bare peat um, restoration to stabilize it before we introduce other sort of moorland moorland species um and it's yeah it's pretty beautiful um uh and it's got these kind of wavy wavy stems up near the flower head so hence it's hence its name um beautiful um and here, what have we got here uh so this next one is mat grass um which often find on sort of uh, shallower soils and sort of slightly steeper ground you often find it sort of around the sort of um crags and and things in the in the peak um and sort of next to and by some footpaths and things like that um it kind of um grows in these small sort of little little humps and and sort of uh, quite sort of narrow blades of grass um and the sort of flower heads um they kind of form on sort of one side of the of the stem um um and this time of year they're probably not quite yet open but there's sort of like a black sort of line along one side and when they open out it kind of opens out sort of like a comb sort of sticking out at, at um, right angles to the to the stem so um you can see those and sometimes you'll see those sort of left from previous years with the sort of um little comb like things sticking out so yeah it's a, it's a good one it goes kind of quite a light sort of paley pale sort of white color almost over winter so um yeah you can see that those color changes as well but um and i think i recognize this one as the uh the yorkshire fog is it uh yep yeah, yeah so yorkshire yorkshire fog like a bit more of a sort of meadow sort of species so one you might see when you're sort of walking up before you get up onto the up onto the tops of the moorland but um yeah and um I sort of taught to identify it by looking right down at the base of the stem um where it kind of um you can see the sort of pink stripes on the um, on the bottom of the stem. So I was told to look out for the pinky stripe pajamas as being uh, yeah Yorkshire fog ID tip. So yeah, that's a that's a good one, and it sticks in the mind, which I think is always find is quite key for yeah to identify things. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> Rhyming or with uh, the stripy pink pajamas, where it sticks in my mind definitely. <laughs> Um, so as the summer days start to turn a little bit cooler and autumn takes a hold on the landscape, which species do you tend to notice as the colours start changing? Yeah, I mean, obviously like sort of woodland and trees and things, we kind of quite sort of familiar with the idea of the leaves turning and changing colour and stuff, but but also out in the moors and um, and other other plants as well and, and species changing colours. So 
um, things like the common cotton grass, the cotton grass um, will change um, sort of the ready sort of brownie colours coming out more, as you can see here, sort of around this sort of bit of a pool. And um, yeah, it's uh, um, kind of becomes a bit more apparent. I think also with the sort of other vegetation, so we've probably got some mat grass in the back here, that's becoming paler and um, yeah, those, those kind of colour changes stand out. But um, I think one of my favourites is um, deer grass, which is um, similarly actually to the cotton grasses, which aren't actually grass, grasses despite the name. It, um, it's a it's a sedge, but uh, it kind of goes this beautiful kind of golden brown sort of slightly striped um, um, coloration over sort of autumn winter time, and it's yeah it's really it's quite striking, quite beautiful. Um, so yeah, it's one to look out for. I've got a photo of it in sort of summer summer plumage as we, as we like here with the seed heads and um, and still green, but um, but yeah, once it starts to sort of uh, go through to autumn and, and winter time, it's, it's yeah, that's a it's a stunning one. So keep your eyes peeled. You said that's a that's a sedge, not a grass. So what's what's the difference between a grass and a sedge? So one of the ways to sort of determine between the two and to and to remember is, um, if you get the sort of stem between your finger and thumb and sort of rub it around a bit, um, the you feel on the on the sedges, so such as the um, the cotton grass and the um, and the and the deer grass here um but it's kind of got like it's angular it's got like a, an edge to it so um the, the rhyme of sedges have edges is uh, yeah how I, I remember remember that one but um another another classic rhyme there that's great um and we have some beautiful pictures of um some sphagnum here yeah obviously in autumn as other things start to sort of die back the grasses and um uh, some of the shrubs and stuff, um, these are leaves, um, you sort of notice other things that are sort of perhaps there all the time, but you don't see them so clearly or don't stand out quite so much with the colours. Um, so yeah, so a sort of sphagnum here, we've got like a carpet of carpet of sphagnum there between some sort of big tussocks of um, possibly hare's tail, hare's tail cotton grass. Um, and yeah, different sort of colours of different species of sphagnum. So yeah, the sort of one top right here, sort of beautiful sort of um, uh, sort of reddy purpley color um but but you get some sort of variation in amongst the different species but also in individual species depending where it's growing and what conditions it's in in terms of how much water there is or how much nutrients in the in the ground and um um yeah so that can can, can vary quite a bit between different different species um uh you can and talking about uh, and the, the, uh, the amount of water that they hold um I imagine you've probably had your fair share of uh, water up on the moors whilst you've been there taking a closer look at the sphagnum, have you? Yep, yep. I mean, it's uh, sphagnum likes likes its rain to to keep it um keep it wet. So uh, yeah, that's often the conditions it's in, uh, and we're in as well when we're up there. So um, yeah, I mean, my first sort of trip out uh, with the science team, um, sort of helping them out on a on a project and getting to see one of the sites was out um, counting the individual heads on the sphagnum on a, on a monitoring site for a, one of their research projects uh, near Black Hill and, and doing that one day in November a couple of years ago in the pouring rain. Uh, but we managed to get the, the uh, group shelter over the, over the quadrat we were surveying whilst we were doing it to sort of allow us to focus a bit more on the counting and, and less on the sort of rain running down your neck. But uh, yeah, it's uh, all, all part of the fun, part of the experience. Um, that's fantastic. Um, we also have the more moss guide that's um, a possible to download in the handout section on the right hand side of your screen there. Um, and I believe that does feature some of the variation in colours as well um, that Chris was talking about. Yeah. Um, lovely. Excellent. So moving on to winter. Um, winter can often be thought of as quite a bleak time on the moors. Yeah, it, it is the time in which the, the majority of the conservation works takes place due to the breeding bird season taking place in the summer. Um, I've seen some fascinating images of um, frozen vegetation. But what, uh, what changes would you expect to see uh, at this time of year um, that's often thought of as quite an unforgiving time? Yes, obviously, sort of the various different um, species dying back a bit more and some of the grasses sort of losing some of the, the leaves and, and the sort of 
sort of um, dieback of the growth and things. Um, and it sort of gives further opportunity to see some of the things underlying that um, that are less visible at other times of the year. Um, some of the some of the lichens are, are around sort of um, uh, are quite uh, quite good to spot. Um, and yeah, um, so we've got some pictures here. Um, top left, what um, one of the cladonias um, with sort of red. Um, red tips which look really sort of vibrant and bright in over sort of winter time when everything else is starting to look a bit drab and gray and um and that yeah really stands out and it's really nice to nice to see um and the reindeer lichen down in the sort of bottom bottom left um it's also yeah quite quite attractive and it's another sort of um uh, Cladonia lichen, lichen species um and yeah i guess the sort of the the winter vistas that you get you get like a bit of snow uh, dusting of snow it looks looks very pretty um you ignore the cold feet and cold hands uh, and sort of frozen frozen vegetation and frosted up so you've got some sphagnum in the, in the top right here uh, and, and one of the grasses possibly millennia down in the, the bottom right and i think some of these photos were from uh from november last year in a, in a cold snap that um uh, tom one of the uh, science team captured on one of his, his monitoring sites so um yeah no it's pretty pretty uh beautiful times up there it's often often a bit grim but you still always get nice nice moments to yeah things to enjoy so yeah. still some beautiful things to uh to take hold of uh, your imagination uh, always always the reindeer like and almost looks quite coral-esque there it does it does it's something that reminds me of it yeah. <laughs> right okay should we have a look to see um if we've got any questions so if you do have any questions just pop them into the into the panel now um and we'll start Start answering those now. So Jess asks, is there a colour of sphagnum that you most love to see, Chris? Um, I think some of the um, sort of red, deep sort of red coloured sphagna um, um, are pretty pretty special to see. Sort of a bit less common um, out in the out in the moors, but always um, yeah, always always lovely to see when you do spot them, uh, and especially as some of them sort of the Sagna medium used to be called Magellanicum. Um, it's quite a really important, like peat building species, and it's got a great name, which helps. Um, so yeah, that's always yeah, it's a treat to to spot that. Um, and it's in the it's one of the species that's in the mixes of the plugs that we we use in the conservation work. So hopefully there'll be more of that in the a lot more of that in the future as well. So lovely. Um, thanks, Chris. And um, Barbara asks, are all of the berries edible? uh as long as they are identified correctly and you you know by an expert and certain what they what they are um uh yes i believe they are all, all edible yeah i think you just need to have an expert with you to net to make sure that you're not eating anything that shouldn't be so maybe other things that aren't so yeah always be, oh, yeah. Always be certain what you're eating i think is the uh what are there so how come um have you come across bog myrtle before is that mirica gale bog myrtle i i haven't knowingly no um it's i i have to admit i i need to i need to go out with a, a more dedicated eye to spotting some of the some of the sort of perhaps less common species or, or ones that grow in sort of more sort of niche niche areas um so not not knowingly i mean i may have been past it but uh i have to admit a certain certain days when you're out on the out on the hill and you've got a lot to get done that you've kind of just got to put the blinkers on and not not look at uh yeah not look too closely to identify things but but no it's, it's yeah it's certainly quite a few species that i'd really like to, to spot and spot and find and that's 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 one of them um yeah and sort of sundew as well is a yeah mm. quite quite a beautiful looking sort of a plant that i've not not found myself so yeah, yeah, they're on the list. They're on my <laughs> list to spot as well, those two. Uh, well, what's the difference between ling and heather, Catherine asks? Um, so there's, yeah, sort of three sort of main different types of sort of heather that are on the, on the moors. There's a sort of common, common heather um, and the sort of cross-leaved heather and, and bell heather. Um, and a lot of the heather in the in the peak district at least is um the sort of common the common heather um 
uh, but there's also the sort of the, the bell heather and, and the cross-leaved heath. And if you look closely at the leaves, they've got different number of leaves coming off in different arrangements. So that's one way of identifying them. Uh, and slightly different colours as well in the in the colours of the leaves. So um, it's a way to way to spot them. Um, and yeah, um, it sort of grow in slightly different conditions. The, the um, cross-leaved heath sort of will grow in slightly wetter conditions than the, the um, common heather will normally normally like. So. Lovely, thanks Chris. And Jess asks, will the bilberry pathogen become more common with the onset of climate change, do you know at all? That's a very good question um, uh, and I, I don't know the answer but uh, <laughs> um, yeah it's um, I think it's pretty pretty rare here um, uh, in this area the, the pathogen itself um, but um, but yeah I, I don't really know that's a good question. One to watch out for. Um, and Carolina asks, which of these plants are endangered in Europe? Are there any that are? Oh. That's a good question. Um, I'm not certain of the answer on that one. Um, we'll have to look into that of, one. I know some of them are definitely sort of locally, locally rare, but yeah, I don't know. Um, we, need, we need more of them, <laughs> especially the sphagnum, but uh, yeah. Definitely more of the definitely more of the sphagnum. Um, so any more questions to pop in there? Barbara asks. Uh, just have a look there. Uh, do you see um, much bog asphodel at all? Um, personally, I've seen it on. I've only spotted it on one of the sites I've been been working on, but um, so not very commonly but um yeah but i don't really know as to its sort of true true abundance of presence across the across the moors but yeah i only know personally of one one area where i've where i've seen it but um yeah quite a really pretty um yeah really beautiful plant mm. lovely yellow flower that one isn't it um so well thank you very much everybody for listening today um and thank you very much, Chris, for sharing your uh, your plant IDing journey with us and um, your memories. Oh, very welcome. Thank you. So next in the series will be in a fortnight's time, um, which will be on the 2nd of July. And we'll be joined by conservation quality manager, Chris Fry. And he'll be talking about a life on the moors and how he uses the latest evidence and innovation to advise our team of conservation officers of which Chris Pembroke here is one, on how best to restore our moors. Uh, so thanks again, uh, and thank you, Chris. And thanks very much. Thanks all. Lovely. We'll say goodbye for now. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>